Welcome to Question Time. Tonight we are in Leeds. On tonight's panel, Jake Berry, former minister for the Northern Powerhouse under Theresa May and Boris Johnson, now chair of the Northern Research Group of Conservative MPs, who argue the case for more influence and investment in the North. Labour's Mayor of Greater Manchester, previously a cabinet minister, including health secretary in Gordon Brown's government, Andy Burnham. Francis O'Grady, General Secretary of the Trades Union Congress for nearly 10 years and the first woman appointed to the role. Jürgen Meyer, industrialist, former chief executive of Siemens UK, vice chair of the Northern Powerhouse Partnership and a member of the Industrial Strategy Council, which offers impartial advice to the government. And journalist, founder chair of the Equiano Project, a debate forum focusing on race and politics and presenter of a weekly politics program on GB News, Inaya Falaran Iman. Welcome to my panel, welcome to our audience here in Leeds and of course welcome to you at home. Do join in the conversation on the usual way on social media at BBC Question Time and we'll hear what you've got to say. Okay, our first question tonight is from Keith Butler. Is it now time for the grand old Duke of York to march back down the hill and give his title back to Her Majesty the Queen? What do you think, Keith? I think he's got two. I'm a father of two kids living in York, originally from Leeds, and there's far better role models that we could associate with York and the, the county of Yorkshire. All right. Andy. Well, I can absolutely uh, get where you're coming from, and I know that probably will be felt by a lot of people here. What I would say, though, is we should be careful to brand this the next Annus Horribilis for the royal family, because I heard that on the media last night, and I think in this platinum jubilee year, I think that wouldn't be a, a good way to go. But the way we can prevent that, I think, is Prince Andrew taking more responsibility for what has happened here. So let me just say two things about that. The money. This is a huge sum of money, according to reports, that is being paid. And the truth of the matter is, I used to have a responsibility for these things as culture secretary. There is a, a kind of blurry line between public and private funding when it comes to the royal family. I don't see how it can possibly be right that any of this comes from public funds. I think he needs to take full responsibility. Well, let me just say, this. first of all, Prince Andrew denies all wrongdoing and has been found guilty of nothing at this stage. He's, he's made this settlement. We don't know how much it's for. The reports of. 5 million, 12 million, we don't know. And we don't know where the money's coming from well, either. He has obviously settled. He and has. he needs to take responsibility for that. And I don't see how it should fall to the public purse at all. And there needs to be transparency about that. But the second thing I would say is I don't see how it can be left here either because you talked about the role model uh, angle on this. To say that going to the home and keeping an appointment with a convicted child... Uh, trafficker was honourable, which is what was said. I mean, you can't leave that there. Uh, he needs to, to, um, to face up to this and explain, I think, his behaviour over recent times. Now, I think when the Queen did so what she did... Do you think he needs to do another interview? Well, I would say so. I don't think he do you can think be, be a left good idea, where it, given where how it the is. last one went down? Well, it can't be worse than the last one, but I do think he's left <laughs> questions unanswered. <laughs> what I would just say finally is, clearly, when... The Queen took the decision a couple of weeks ago to strip her son of his titles or his royal role. That can't have been an easy decision, but I would have thought it was done with a knowledge of what was, what was coming. And that's why I say don't let this turn into a run on the royal family or the Queen in this particular year, I, 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 would, uh, I would say. But, but also, though, I, I have to, to say that you can't um, just kind of leave this situation now hanging, because it will hang over the royal family this year, and I think he needs to step forward, take more responsibility for what he has done, explain the money situation, and explain how he got into a position uh, where he was in the company of a convicted child uh, trafficker. Jürgen. Well, I mean, it's, it's been a, a horrible saga, hasn't it? And, uh, and it's been... Uh, it's, it's been a terrible time for the royal family, and I, and I do feel particularly for the Queen, and I do have a huge regard for the royal family, and it's been a particularly terrible ordeal, of course, for the victims of Epstein's horrible uh, offences. Now, you know, I think it would have been good to have had a fair trial, 
but there hasn't been a trial. So I think the public will now be the jury. And it looks like, Keith, you've made your mind up. I get the feeling the audience here has made their mind up, and I suspect the city of York have made their mind up too. And maybe the best thing for Prince Andrew to do would be not to have it taken away from him, but just to voluntarily yeah. give it up in a respectful way. The man here in the front. Yes, you, sir. Uh, <clears throat> I think the decision to settle has been taken out of his hands. I think it's the family firm that have made the decision. OK. And the woman in the red sweater? Yeah, I think it's not logical that he's actually settled because you don't settle if you're innocent. It's... Well, we obviously can't know that and, and you so know, you I have to go... say that Prince Andrew denies all wrongdoing and that he has made no admission of, of any kind of liability. So obviously there should be a, a trial. OK. Let's hear from this man in the front here. Uh, now wondering where he's going to come up with £12 million. <laughs> Yeah, if it indeed is 12 million, of course, we, we don't know. We've no idea how much money it is. Inaya? Well, I do think the principle of innocent until proven guilty is an important one. But there is a moral dimension here. We do know from what has been exposed over the last few years that he did meet up with a, a convicted uh, sex offender after he was already convicted, and that raises huge questions uh, on the whole. And I do think that there's serious questions to be asked about, you know, where the money is coming from and, and, and whether or not his position in public life stands in general. But I do think the entire trial has raised some important questions about what a lot of uh, potential victims of, of sex crime have to face, having their uh, image dragged uh, through the mud, their entire reputation, their lives scrutinised. You can often understand why some people feel very scared to come forward and not wanting to have that kind of exposure. Um, that often happens in terms of their entire image uh, examined in much detail. So we don't know the entire circumstances of, of why the settlement um, was taken, but I do think that, you know, his position in the forefront of public life is still quite untenable, and I think you're right to say that actually it's now the decision of the public, really, if they find it very comfortable to be seeing his face representative of, of the UK. Mm. And, uh, Jake, what about this question of money because there have been some who said look if this money has come from the Queen it's up to her how she disperses it or not others have said if it comes from the sovereign grant which effectively comes from the public it shouldn't be part of that is that something that concerns you well I think in the course of public opinion that Jürgen referred to there is a desire for the royal family to clarify that no taxpayers money whatsoever has been used as part of this settlement and I think Either the government will clarify that or the royal family could clarify it. I think that will enable us as a nation to start to move on. And I would so do you think, because obviously at the moment they're not saying where the money's come from, well, I but think, do you think I, they should? I think they should, yes, absolutely. And I'd hold... <laughs> to pick up on Andy's point, I'd hold in stark contrast to the, uh, issue, you know, the, the issues surrounding Prince Andrew, who is acting as a private citizen now, the return of Her Majesty the Queen to public duties just yesterday, demonstrating 70 years service. She said, oh, I can barely move because uh, she's got a problem with her foot, apparently. And, you know, long may she reign in this Platinum Jubilee year. I think she is a fantastic figurehead for our country. And it does contrast with the uh, behaviour and the associations of Prince Andrew. Okay. Man here in the blue shirt. Apart from being a member of the royal family, he was supposed to be an officer and a gentleman. He was no officer and he's certainly no gentleman. And as such, he should fall on his sword. What, and relinquish the title relinquish of Duke of York? relinquish everything, yeah. And the man behind you in the jazzy green glasses. Thank you. Um, the, the settlement keeps this out of court, but if I understand correctly, there is no gagging order. Uh, there's a gagging order perhaps for this jubilee year, but thereafter, um, uh, this lady can say whatever she wants. So, so I is this even money well spent from his perspective? Francis. I think there's another principle that really matters in this country, and that's about equality before the law. And I have to say that I think this woman, Virginia, I think she has been incredibly brave in taking on wealth, power and privilege. That, you know, as, as was said, it is no easy thing. Anybody who's ever spoken to a victim of sexual assault, women or men, in fact, 
know how hard it is for them to come and report that. To do that when you're dealing with such rich and powerful men and women, really, I think she deserves all our thanks. And I really hope that she encourages other women to step up and voice you know, when that happens to them. Because the only way we're going to stop this behaviour is when all of us speak up. Uh, <laughs> Now, in terms of Prince Andrew, and I think it is a matter for the people of York, and I'm sure they will make their judgment clear, but he said he's now going to be a champion uh, for victims of sexual assault. Well, I think one practical way of showing that, there is nothing to stop him now of going to the FBI, being interviewed, and telling every detail of everything he knows of what did go on. And I think he should do that. That would be the right thing. And when it comes to the money, I have to say from my perspective, not a single penny of public money should be used to bail him out. I'll just say a bit more from the audience before I move on. Yes, the man at the back in the grey sweater. Yeah, so I agree exactly with what was being said just before there. Um, we've used words like morals, accountability. I work in education um, within Safeguarding particularly as well. If something on this magnitude, this kind of scale, was to take place, we'd be expected to step down, the police would be involved, there'd be referrals that would follow you for the rest of your life. I'd like to know when we're going to live in a society where actually you can't just throw money at a problem and it'll just go away, because that's all we're seeing time and time again at this present time. The woman in the red top there in the middle with the glasses. I was sort of on the fence whether he was guilty, not guilty, uh, but for me, the fact that they've now settled out of court it's sort of an admission of guilt. Um, I mean, he hasn't, he, not, he hasn't admitted guilt, but that's how it see, seems yeah, to you. That's, yeah, that's how it comes across, because if it goes to court, it might be found guilty. OK, I'm going to move on. But before I do, I just want to tell you where we're going to be uh, next week. We will be in Harrow, where we'll be joined by the Hollywood director and writer Armando Iannucci, and also by Catherine Burbell Singh, the head teacher and chair of the government's Social Mobility Commission. So if you want to put your seats for that, let us know. The following week we will be in Norwich and we'd love to have you if you live either near Harrow or Norwich. Go to the Question Time website and you can follow the instructions there and come and be part of our audience. We'd love to see you. OK, let's take another question from Tanya. Tanya Stevenson. Will the government's overview of plans for levelling up really help the North and other areas catch up or is it just rhetoric to help deflect from the government's general other issues? I can't think what issues you're, you're thinking of there, uh, Tanya. <laughs> Jake? Um, absolutely, I think it will. Um, I think the right person to implement those plans is Michael Gove. He is a uh, government machine and works across government. But what we've really got to get to the heart of is that you don't need a levelling up white paper to transform communities across the north. George Osborne didn't need a levelling up white paper to create Andy Burnham as the mayor of Manchester, or Theresa May didn't need a levelling up white paper when she created Tracy Braben, the mayor here in West Yorkshire. So what will deliver levelling up isn't legislation and discussions in Parliament, it's an ambition to change the economy of the North of England, to re-industrialise the North with good high quality jobs, particularly focusing on green technology, and also it will be the people of the North who level up the North, it's the government's job to be a facilitator to provide an infrastructure, to provide a legislative framework. But we have to look to ourselves to deliver that growing economy. And how committed do you think the government is, given that you were minister for the Northern Powerhouse, you resigned uh, later, and there is no such position anymore? Well, there is a minister for the Northern Powerhouse. It's the Transport Secretary, Grant Shapps. But he's a Transport Secretary, he is, as opposed got, to he, it being a specific busy. job. He's got other stuff to do, and I think... Um, it's a loss. I attended Cabinet. I would say this, wouldn't I? But I think it's not about me doing the job. I think it's a loss for the North of England not to have that independent voice of the Cabinet getting up every single morning thinking, how can I deliver for the North? Going to bed thinking exactly the same thing, which is what I used to do. Andy. So let me agree, firstly, on Michael Gove, because I think he does bring sort of uh, energy and intellect to what he does. And the white paper, if I just sort of look at it at face value and not try and score points, there was a lot in it I could welcome. So one thing was in there 
that is something that has been a clear demand from me and from Greater Manchester, London-style public transport outside of London for cities outside. To me, that means London-level fares, £1.55 a bus journey. What would, that, what would that do to people here? So that's a, good, that's a good promise. I've taken the decision in Manchester to put buses back under public control so that we can create a London-style system, but we now need the support, the revenue support that London has had for years. So that the rhetoric, as you say, in the white paper was OK, but what's the reality? I've been briefed today that because we have no COVID recovery funding for buses committed yet beyond the end of March, and the same is true here in West Yorkshire, 30 bus services, bus routes, are at risk of being axed and the frequency of others is going to be, going to be dropped. And I've seen Tracy Brabin, Mayor of West Yorkshire, raising the same concerns that already bus services are going to be axed here. That's the gap between the rhetoric and the reality. But at and least also the government's on... coming up with the rhetoric. Was you look at the record under well, Labour, I... for example, they came up with the tram proposal, they just scrapped it. Well, I, I see... It wasn't, it wasn't any I, better I've then. I've supported levelling up as a concept. Uh, Labour expanded the tram in Manchester, but I wish we should, we'd done more for the North. We should have done more for the North when we were, we were in government. But there's another one, you know, a new railway line via Manchester, Leeds to Manchester. That was the promise. The Prime Minister made it in front of Stevenson's rocket four days into office. What have we got? Half a line that misses out Bradford completely. A proud young city like Bradford completely cut off uh, the network. So these are the kind of problems that they've got now. They've raised expectations of people here. They came here for people's votes and they said... We're going to level you up with the South. We're going to close the North-South divide. The trouble is, the rhetoric is not matching... Uh, the reality is not matching the rhetoric, and the truth of the matter is, the North-South divide has got wider during this pandemic. All right, lots of hands up. Let's hit you. The one here in the front, in the moon sweater, yes. Um, I think it's, it's incumbent on, on the South, on London, to uh, utilise hybrid working to help people in the North have access to jobs that they wouldn't have done from a geographic perspective. And I think that's really important in terms of levelling up. What, you want people to, to so, uh, I think work it, from home more well, in the South? Well, have reason? more access in the North to jobs that would have primarily been in the South through hybrid working, so enable more of people in the North to have access to those jobs. All right, the woman behind you. I think Jake's absolutely right. It doesn't need a levelling up white paper. It needs a proper commitment, proper investment, and the government not to go back on their promises. Leeds has the worst transport system in the, in the whole of the country, never mind the north. We've been waiting for a tram for 30 years, so actually it needs that real investment to make it happen. And are you encouraged by what the government's been saying in the, in the white paper in particular? Not at all, because they'll just change their mind again, won't they? And take the, the promised money that isn't even new money and then probably take it away again. They do. All right. The man there in the, in the blue zip-up top, yeah. Um, when you said you uh, levelling up, you, it's the transport secretary. It doesn't feel like a priority. It just feels like an afterthought, like something else that he has to do. Man here. Thank you. I was going to say um, Manchester has a fantastic public transport network, and I was going to make a point, but I think Andy Burnham made it far better than I could have done. I think he's absolutely right. We need to have action, not just rhetoric. Okay. Well, in I, this is this is an area no well. I mean, you stood for the Brexit Party here. You went to university here. What's your view? Yeah, I mean, I, I think a lot of people, when they think of uh, Brexit, the failure to realise levelling up, I think a lot of people point Brexit for that. But essentially, Brexit was a constitutional question about who should govern this country. And the decision that was made in 2016 by the majority of British people was that it should be the people of the United Kingdom. And I think... What I mean, Brexit's not in the question. But, 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 but what we then do with that power is, to me, a question of the political class. And I think that we've had so many promises. I don't think that the mandate of an 80-seat majority in 2019 is one of the biggest you know, mandates that you can get in order to uh, transform the country in a way that actually works for ordinary people. And levelling up was meant to be part of that. And undoubtedly, there's been challenges in relation to COVID and so on. But I think the British public have been incredibly forgiving. And I think that now is the time, as has been mentioned, to meet rhetoric with reality. There's so much opportunity, for example, you mentioned uh, new green jobs, but for example, there's a, uh, a moratorium on fracking, which here in Yorkshire actually can provide huge opportunity uh, in terms of jobs and investment, in terms of when you're talking about place and location, that's very important in Level Up, but there's not actually the, the funding to, to back it up. So I do think there's a lot of frustration, understandably, that a lot of the rhetoric is not being met with reality. But isn't that you know, Whitehall not understanding levelling up, because you talk about Brexit. When people voted to take back control, it was as much about taking back control from Whitehall and returning powers to the north of England as it was from Brussels. And that's where I think 
what we've really got to push the government on is devolution across the entirety of the north of England, give us the power mm -hmm. and the ability to drive our own reality and economy and opportunities. But, Andy, the price for that is that we've got to take responsibility as well. And the biggest challenge to bus services in my area is the Manchester Clean Air Zone. Uh, well, you might need to explain that for those of you who don't know. I mean, this is, this is typical, I'm afraid, of, of the modern Conservative Party. Mm. They impose... Because you seem to be they in agreement just now. I okay. agree with him on many things, but not on this. They impose something on us, as they've done on other cities, Birmingham, Bath, other places, uh, a legal requirement on our councils to clean up the air. They don't fund it properly, exactly. You know, we're, we're left with this legal directive, not enough funding, and then they campaign against it. Now, you, hang, let's, explain, let's explain, just for those who aren't familiar with it, that the clean air zone would have been a charge. It's a £60 on... a day charge for buses. £7.50, so, I think, for taxis and £10 so the idea for vans. But is, the, problem, the problem with it it's, is... It's your isn't, government's isn't policy. Clean, uh, well, you, you, we designed, tried to work, you designed the policy. We tried to work with you the government. You created a 500 square so, mile on, one, one clean one air time. zone, which is going to put bus companies out of business, going to put plumbers, mobile hairdressers, okay, taxi drivers out of business just over the policy. border in Lancashire. This is your government's policy. Your policy is to place uh, these directives on local councils and we've worked in good faith to try and implement it, but I went back to your government, wait a second, yeah. and said to them, this isn't going to work because you refused a hardship fund for people on the lowest incomes and actually there's now inflation in the vehicle market, it's not going to work. But this is the point, the dishonesty of this. It's a national government policy well, and then you not. campaign against it. Sorry. What you do is you impose housing targets on local councils, then you campaign against the green belt take at local level, your councillors. You, you cut councils in their budget, then you campaign against council tax rises when councils got no other choice but to do that. You impose this directive on clean air and then you all come out saying scrap the clean air oh, zone. Sorry, it's the dishonesty yeah, yeah. of the modern Conservative Party playing from the Trump handbook. An answer before I move on. Yeah, so when we're talking about honesty, the government imposed an obligation, quite correctly, yeah. on Greater Manchester to deal with air pollution. Greater Manchester authorities, in your combined so authority, you which you the lead, policy, you've just acknowledged, policy yeah. to, deal, to deal with air pollution, so you designed a 500, almost, square mile clean air zone with no mitigation but whatsoever signed, for people to live that just off? outside. Well, who signed that it off was today? A policy the Environment by, Secretary. It was a policy Take designed Take responsibility your for your own government's policies. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. It was a policy designed by your councils. Let's look how other areas have done it, Andy. Leeds, Birmingham, clean, cleaned up where they air. included cars. Yeah, okay, let, let him on. Leeds so. cleaned up air by traffic mitigation. Portsmouth, a three-kilometre congestion zone. Birmingham, where the leader of Portsmouth small, said it was imposed on Portsmouth and they wanted zone. to do something Greater different. Greater Manchester, five hundred okay. square miles. I tell only you what, affecting people who are driving to work. Let's hear from Plumbers, our audience. What do you make of all this? Mobile hairdressers, taxi drivers. Come on, woman here in the blue jacket. It's not always about money. Um, I looked at the levelling up paper, I've worked in regeneration for many, many years and I didn't see an awful lot that was new. Yes, cuts are terrible, we all know that, but how is our money being spent? I have worked in areas where millions of pounds have been spent, places like Bradford, Andy, that, that you mentioned, a great city, a city I cut my teeth in, actually, in terms of work, but you go back to Bradford now and it's probably worse than when I worked there many years ago. How are we spending the money that we have and what about the quality of leadership of some of our cities? And what do you make failing, of this, what failing, do you make of this failing clear, cities, clean air zone cities. argument that you're hearing? Bradford might have to have one. So that's a difficult question. I'm not sure I'm qualified to, to answer that <laughs> the one. Point okay. Okay. <laughs> Let me hear more from the audience. The man at the back in the green sweater. Yeah, um, Andy, what you said earlier regarding the, tra the trains is completely right. I mean, if you look at the, the integrated rail plan that's been announced, £96 billion, pounds, I think it is, £42.5 billion of that is for HS2. It's not even coming here. So that's, you know, that's one point there. Um, I know that I've, I've watched plenty of these programmes, and, you know, Jake, you'll be brief with, well, the improvements we're going to make, they're going to come quicker. They're going to they're be announced quicker. The point you've missed is that we needed those improvements and we needed the high-speed line. We needed both. Yeah, when, I, you're right. when, when you're in a situation where living in Leeds, it's actually quicker for you to get a job in London and go there and back rather than to Manchester, mm. I think you've got an issue. Um, okay. you know. and, and the man behind you. 
Just building on building on the gentleman's point, have the plans to cancel HS2 to, to Leeds not dealt a body blow to the levelling up plans? Yeah. And especially if we compare um, our, our rail network in this country to our friends in Europe, we are woefully in inadequate. Francis. I mean, I, I think you're absolutely right. We've got a real problem in this country of very deep regional inequality. And there's some practical stuff. I know it's not all about the money, but if you don't invest in properly in your transport infrastructure, in particular, for green reasons, we want to see rail thrive, not just up and down the country, but across the country. If you don't do that, you won't attract the investment from other sources, you won't attract the jobs, you know, you, you won't attract the skills. So getting that investment in infrastructure is really, really important. But there's something else that I think is important because I don't think levelling up is going to mean anything unless it's also about levelling up the quality of the jobs and apprenticeships that we have in this country. We've got too, much, too many low-paid insecure jobs and maybe we'll come on to this later but with the cost of living you know soaring for many families are in real trouble and i want to hear more from the government and frankly this affects every region in the country where is the employment bill that that was promised years ago we were going to have an employment bill that would get rid of zero hours contracts that would get rid of bogus self-employment that would give people a bit of dignity on the job. Where is it? Why hasn't it happened? You know, we've got a Prime Minister busy filling out his questionnaire when we need some focus on what's happening to working people in this country and our right, I believe, to have a decent chance in life wherever we live. Jürgen, will the government's overview of plans for levelling up really help the North and other areas catch up or is it just rhetoric? Of course, you're proudly wearing your badge there. As Vice Chair of the Northern Powerhouse <laughs> Partnership. I, I, I am indeed. And, and I must admit, I feel like I, I want to start with maybe lifting the mood slightly because I don't want our viewers here from the South thinking we're, uh, we're, we're living in some grim city up here in uh, Leeds. And in fact, I, I, mean, I grew up here in the, in the 70s and the 80s, and coming back here is such a pleasure. Uh, to see what a transformed city this is and, uh, and how much better it is. But, of course, exactly what Francis says is right. Unfortunately, those opportunities are not open to everybody, and they're particularly not open to people who come from maybe less privileged backgrounds, maybe people who haven't had the privilege to go to a wonderful school like this grammar school we're sat in here today. So much more needs to be done. Now, I'm a champion of reindustrialization, of creating the new green economies of the future and bringing some of our great northern cities back to that, that real modern industrialization. And I'm actually working with Greater Manchester on doing uh, some of that great work and we need to do a lot more. But the issue is actually money. It does come down to serious money. Now, I can give you a comparison. I've seen proper levelling up done when Germany reunited with East Germany. They had a policy of investing about 70 billion euros per year. 70 billion per year. And we are talking about a few hundred million maximum on spending on our great northern cities like Leeds here, Manchester, Newcastle and all the rest of it. And OK, maybe we don't need 70 billion but 200 or a few million is not enough. So we need much more ambition behind the levelling up white paper missions. That's what we need. Let's take another question from Gary Kelly. Has President Putin already won? Do you think so? I think he's right in the balance and depends very much on whether or not the West can stay, <coughs> excuse me, united and i think there are cracks that are fairly obvious which means that the balance is now swinging the wrong way Jürgen, i wanted to come to you actually first as i know we've just heard from you but uh, the issues in terms of whether putin has already won is in terms of how united the west is in its approach germany's taken a very different approach for example to the two, to the one arguably of the uk or to france what's your view well my view is is that Putin 
most definitely hasn't won. Um, and, you know, I very much hope he doesn't. Now, there's no question about it that Putin's strategy is and has always been uh, to divide, particularly Europe. That has been his strategy for many, many years. Now, I personally think that some of our criticism of Europe has been unfair. I think this has actually shown Europe and, indeed, the whole of NATO a real purpose. And whilst I think Putin has come out to test NATO and its partners, I actually think that he might have been a little bit surprised by the strength at which the fight back has been. And, of course, it's great to see Britain uh, very much uh, involved in that. Yes, Germany has a slightly different approach. But, no, and but I, the, there's no agreement on sanctions, for example, at the moment, exactly what those sanctions should be. No, no, I, I, I think there are. I think that, uh, you know, certainly the UK has made clear the sanctions, and I think Germany is very clear of its sanctions and indeed knows that there is going to be some economic pain for gas supplies. In the UK, there will be pain in terms of not um, having uh, lots of Russian money investing, uh, uh, especially in our uh, London city. And I think people know that that is going to be painful. But to say that there is some fragmentation going on here, I don't think is true. I think nations are pulling together, are doing their damnedest, and are absolutely determined to make sure that war doesn't happen, which would be an absolute tragedy, obviously, for the people on the ground in Ukraine, but also for all of us in Europe. Inaya? Um, I think I'd probably slightly disagree. I think undoubtedly uh, Russia is far from a liberal democratic society and they have much form when it comes to Ukraine, for example, annexing Crimea not too long ago. So I think that we should be very cautious when it comes to dealing uh, with the Russian regime. But I would say that I would also be somewhat sceptical of many of the statements coming out from, from Western leaders. We've had in the last few days uh, talk that you know an invasion is, is imminent we were even told that there was a, a date yesterday and that's not necessarily been the case so I do worry about the talk well it definitely up. hasn't been the case because oh. they haven't invaded yet well, so, exactly. that was be so I, I think I, I worry about the kind of talking up of the possibility uh, of war and uh, an imminent threat in a way that actually could be hugely escalating tension in a time where I do think there is a lot of weakness and uh, contradictions within Western society. You have Germany, for example, uh, potentially dependent on en energy from Russia through Nord Stream 2. We have, for example, you know, one of our closest allies, Canada, right now, one of the most liberal, open countries actually invoking never used before powers in order to squash working class organising. And we have... Uh, uh, America in retreat, for example, what we saw with the disastrous exit uh, from uh, Afghanistan. So I do think that there, whether or not we have the moral authority to have a kind of coherent position on the world stage remains to be seen. So I would rather see a much more de-escalation of rhetoric, a de-escalation of tensions, and not the kinds of uh, upping the rhetoric that we've seen over the last few weeks. Man here in front. Is it not the West who've instigated this escalation by inviting Ukraine into NATO? They, 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 they haven't formally invited Ukraine into NATO. It, they seem to be approaching that, and I mean, you well, look at NATO, NATO's. Um, sorry, the Ukraine is in its constitution says it wants to join NATO, and that's that's a long process, um, and, and it may well be many years hence. But still, I think that the fact that that's coming along, I mean, what what, what else is Russia supposed to do when a, you know an anti-Russian organisation are inviting or? or have Ukraine joining the organisation? Jake? Yeah, I mean, I think the premise of your comment is wrong. NATO is not an anti-Russian organisation. It is a, a collective defence organisation. And to answer the first question very directly, I actually think President Putin has lost. And he's lost, in my view, for two reasons. When he annexed Crimea, an illegal act by Russian forces and Russian-backed forces, he awakened in the people of Ukraine, a real national identity. And I think we saw that yesterday in their national day where you saw the nation coming together and saying that we want to resist with all means possible any invasion from Russia. That national identity for Ukrainians wasn't as strong because it is a complicated country with Russian-speaking parts and, and uh, other parts which regard themselves as Ukrainian only. It wasn't as strong before 2014. So I think that was a strategic error in terms of President Putin's wider ambitions. 
And secondly, I think he's lost because he has reinvigorated and rejuvenated NATO, which it needed as a defensive alliance. He's brought Britain, I think, to the forefront of the international effort to persuade Putin to embrace um, you know, non-military means to open the door to international diplomacy. So I think in the long term, for President Putin, he has made the wrong move, and I think he will realise that, and I'm just very pleased that NATO has, after quite a long period of not being effective, become an effective defence cooperation and collaboration force once again. Woman in the red sweater. Um, if the UK goes ahead and places further sanctions on Russia, and then Russia decides to cut off gas supplies to Europe, could that raise energy prices even more in this country and have dire economic like consequences for us? Francis. I guess, well, that, that has to be uh, a big concern. And it's one of the reasons why my best hope often lies in ordinary people and talking to our friends in trade unions in Russia and Ukraine. And they both want peace. And they both want governments to de-escalate because we know that when it comes to conflict and violence, it's always ordinary people who end up paying the price one way or another. And the question in terms of has President Putin already won? Well, having said that, I have to say that, you know, there are some very, in my view, there have been some very dangerous men in positions of power uh, in the world. I put Donald Trump and I put President Putin in the same category in my book. They're both nationalists they're both disrespectful of democracy they're both um they lie <laughs> they uh you know they play games uh and they rip up the rule book and so you know i th i think it, i think we always have to pursue every avenue to, including diplomacy i think we have to be ready to clean up the city exactly as jürgen said how come we're the capital of dirty Russian money in Europe? How come? David Cameron promised to clean that up. You would have thought it would have been cleaned up after the Salisbury poisonings. And yet still, we've had no significant shift in terms of cleaning up the city. And I have to say, Jake, as I understand it, there are plenty of donors to the Conservative Party, including cabinet ministers who have links and support Putin. I mean, can't we get overseas money of the wealthy out of our politics once and for all? Do you want to answer that point about Russian donations to the Conservative? I mean, it, it's, it's, what is it, some, is it two, two million, I think it is? Nearly two million uh, has been given by Russian-born donors or people with business links to Russia. Um, either to the Conservative Party or individual associations since uh, Boris Johnson took power? Well, the, look, the rules are simple, aren't they? British citizens can donate to political parties. It's a similar thing we've seen with the Labour Party and Barry Gardner receiving donations from a British citizen who was named as uh, allegedly working for the Chinese government. But politics actually goes beyond rules. Both of those donations, the one I've referred to in the, and the donation you've referred to, are well, within the rules. Well, that was several donations but up to just under 2 million. it's also about judgment. And I think that we need politicians, when accepting money, whether political parties or individuals, need to exercise judgment. There should be no room whatsoever for Russian money well, in Britain. Well, would you hand it back? Well, well, hand it back. If, if I was in charge, I would, actually. Good. Absolutely. There's no room for Russian money in British politics, and there's also no room for money coming from the Chinese state, either in British politics. So why, they may both why is be in the compliance with the rules. Bill making it they may, for they may both be in compliance with the rules. To fund politics. The election bill that's before Parliament now is designed to make it easier for wealthy individuals overseas to put money into our politics. Why? Well, I don't accept that, but what I would say is we've got to go beyond the rules and expect politicians to exercise judgment. Look, it's really this simple. If you're a member of Parliament, whether you're a cabinet minister or a backbench MP, and the phone rings and it's someone holding themselves out to give you money, but they have strong links with Russia or with China or with any hostile state, my advice would be put the phone down and say no. OK. We'll the back with the blonde hair. Um, do we not need to prepare... We're talking, like, a lot about the war on the ground in Ukraine, but do we not need to prepare if China is supporting Russia for the... Um, potential for cyber attacks by no longer purchasing Chinese IT infrastructure? 
Andy. Well, I mean, that is a, a fair point, because where does this where does this go? I think to pick up what Jürgen said, and I think what Jake said, to be fair, the unity of the response in this instance has been good. But, Jake, if you're sitting there in Ukraine tonight with your kids going to bed, you will not think that Putin has lost. Definitely not. You will be worried out of your mind, and I think we should think about uh, those people tonight. The way I look at it is I think you've got to deal with the current situation but also understand how we got to this because in my judgment the political class here and around the world the western world is complicit in the situation that we're seeing in front of us now for the reasons that i think uh, francis uh, was was touching on there's too, too many people have been too close policy has been too inconsistent uh, on on russia and at times it's been too weak i was sitting on this panel six or seven years ago just after the annexation of Crimea, and I said, and I got some controversy, but I said it, we should be boycotting the 2018 World Cup in Russia. And I thought at that time it, it was just going to have to happen. How could the world go to Russia as if nothing had happened? But it did. It did. And it's barely believable that that happened, but it did happen. And if you come closer to home, there are donations. And we had a, a peer this week saying, Lord Falk, saying that he put forward a a register for this money, and it was quietly shelved by, by Whitehall. So you do ask the question, why? But let's not make this partisan in any way. I think on the left, there's been too much uh, appeasement at times of, of Russia and too much apology for them. I was Shadow Home Secretary in the House of Commons responding to the, re the inquiry on Litvinenko, and I had a, a pretty strong statement that some senior figures at that time uh, working on, on our side, tried to water down, but... Oh, do you I, say who? No, I'm not going to, because it wouldn't be right right now. But, but I can just say to you, that did happen. And well, it I did get feel, watered down. No, it didn't. It did not. Uh, but that is, I think, the issue here. There's too many people on both sides of politics that have been too close to people in the regime. What, we've got to deal with the situation in front of us, but coming out of it, exactly as you were saying in your question, there needs to be a long-term, clear strategy about how, as an international community, we deal with Russia. It needs to be consistent, it needs to be tough where it needs to be, uh, and it has to be multilateral, where all countries buy into it and we deal with these issues like energy uh, reliance as well. All right. We're going to take another question from Richard Lee. Where are you? There you are. Why has anybody from the post office been made accountable for the jailing of innocent people wrongly accused of theft. So, of course, we've got the public inquiry going on at the moment, but it so is, yeah, far... But it's, it's got, uh, the, the cases of the jails gone on from 2004. Exactly. So this has been going on for 20-odd for years, and so far no-one, either from Fujitsu, which is a company that... Uh, uh, came up with Horizon, which was the IT system, which went wrong, neither from Fujitsu nor from the post office, has been held to account. Francis. Well, like everybody else, I've read these stories, you know, people whose lives have been turned upside down, have been ruined. You know, a woman who was pregnant, sent to jail, completely innocent, but sent to jail. Um, you know, it kind of beggars belief. Uh, clearly, somebody at some point has got to be held accountable for what went wrong. Somebody has to own up and, you know, be held responsible for ruining so many lives. And, and why do you think it's not happened so far? Because this has been going on such a long time. Well, I've been involved in a number of justice campaigns from the for the TUC, um, Andy. Uh, we, we were talking about Hillsborough, we were talking uh, about the Shrewsbury campaign, um, the Grenfell campaign, the Covid bereaved families. And one thing that worries me, they're all very different, but the same pattern seems to be that it gets spun out and spun out and very often the people who were looking for justice over time pass away. You know, Forgive me for being cynical, but it sometimes seems like this is a deliberate strategy to take as long as possible to get people the justice they deserve. And I think it's wrong. 
And when you talk to families and you see what that means at a personal level, you know, it's, it's so wrong and it needs to be put right. So, Jürgen, the question is, why has no one been held accountable? I just wonder what your perspective is as, as the former head of Siemens UK. So there you are in charge of a big organisation. The post office is a big organisation, but no one has been held accountable. How, how is that the case? And if it was in a company that you were running, how would that work? Well, it's really hard to explain. Uh, and look in all large organisations, and when I was uh, chief executive of Siemens, there was 15,000 people um, in the workforce in the post office. It's much greater than that. And yes, you have incidents where people do some fraudulent activities. Um, you have that in a large workforce, and therefore you have to deal with it. But when you start to have tens and then hundreds you start to think there's something is not right here there just can't be that many fraudulent people in your organization so some alarm bell should have been ringing to say, but don't forget you know, they've got a new it system yeah, so they but, may have thought now we're seeing for the first time how many people yeah, they not, thought were fraudulent. but not the quantum you were looking at you know i wouldn't have jumped to that conclusion and i would seriously have been questioning the IT system and have been exploring that rather than drawing a conclusion. So, so huge mistakes um, were made, and I'm completely with Francis. You know, I think there needs to be, you know, proper openness, transparency should have happened way before independent investigation. As a matter of fact, you know, and I'll say this as a private business person, and we had our scandals at Siemens, and there are times where you just say, look, we're going to hold our hands up. We're going to let external bodies come in and do an investigation. And in the end, we're going to have to put right what has gone wrong. And unfortunately, that is going to cost some money. It's going to cost some compensation. But I think at this point, especially having dragged on so long, that's the position you need to take as a responsible employer. And do you think it's likely that anyone will be held to account? I hope so. You know, I think in the end, and I think, you know, the pressure is rising again, and when you read the horror stories that you were just talking about in the paper, you know, I think the pressure should be kept up to make sure that there is a full, transparent and independent inquiry that gets to the truth so that people get answers. OK, the man here in the front. Is, if they don't find out who's responsible, is it going to be another, it's your fault, resign, here's a massive pension, enjoy yourself? Well, we may find out, we may well, not. The person here with the... The man with the green glasses. I think the real worry for all of us is that people have been convicted here on evidence that was obviously flawed, and the size and power that the post office uh, possessed as an organisation of its stature clearly overruled what should have been staring everybody in the face. It, it should be a, a, a very, very uh, important lesson for, for all of us. The woman there in the orange and black top. Um, as a small business person myself, I know how difficult it can be to work with larger organisations. I really, really feel for the, the people and the families um, that have found themselves in this situation. It's gone on for far too many years. Um, there have been serious circumstances, um, suicides as a result of it, um, families completely ruined. I was reading about uh, families who were trying to make up the shortfalls because they thought maybe it is their fault somehow. Um, and when the numbers started getting ridiculously high, they just couldn't do it anymore. Somebody has to be held to account. Somebody has to pay in the way that those people had to pay in prison. Um, and I think that includes probably people at Fujitsu, people um, at um, the, the, post, uh, yeah, post, the post office. office. Um, and also, potentially, the CPS should have realised that there were an awful lot of cases relying upon the same evidence. Mm. Jake. Well, uh, um, <laughs> 700 people have already been found accountable for this, but they're all completely innocent. And that is an absolute scandal. And the fact that it's been allowed to go on for so many years but that was those 700 people were prosecuted between the year 2000 and 2014, and no one at the post office has yet been held to account, is an absolute disgrace. 
and it's something which we need to take action on. So let's talk about what we should see, in my opinion. I agree with Jürgen, there needs to be a significant compensation for people who not only were prosecuted and criminalised, but also lost their liberty in many cases. And the first 555 people who took the post office to court, actually more went in legal fees than those people got compensation. That's completely wrong. And in fact, they are going to end up getting less than the subsequent cohort of people who are going to be compensated. And so they are that... asking the government to try and sort that out. The government well, has it... given money to the post office in order to be able to settle these things. But one thing they've said is the government could just give us this fi these 550 well, an ex gratia think... payment to try and to, to make it more fair. Do you think the well, government should do that? I think the money should come from the post office and Fujitsu. Fujitsu uh, created this software and the fact that 700 people were suddenly discovered as being criminals having been worked in the post office network for decades with not a stain on their reputation beforehand and now not a stain afterwards because they've all been completely exonerated and should hold their head high in public for by a piece of software designed by Fujitsu. I don't see why actually the taxpayer should be forking out for a problem caused by Fujitsu. I think Fujitsu should pay up, be held accountable. And I also agree with Jürgen Maher's view that we need a, a proper independent inquiry to make sure that this miscarriage of justice, this travesty, this disgrace against people in the post office can never happen again in any other organisation. The man at the back of the glass. Question of accountability. When, when, our, when the rich and powerful in our country, the question of uh, the member of the royal family or the, or the leaders in Downing Street are not being held accountable for, for their very misdeeds and misjudgments, then how can we expect the, the uh, people like Fujitsu or, or others um, to be held accountable? Yeah. Andy. Well, I completely agree. Jake says it should never happen again. Of course, that's right. But it does. It does. This keeps on repeating the same the same pattern. The gentleman is right to say, will there be accountability? Well, I, I hope the inquiry gets to the truth. But all I can say, I work with the Hillsborough families yeah. and we help them get to the truth after 30 years. But nobody, nobody held accountable for 97 unlawful deaths in that, in that case. One small finding against Sheffield Wednesday Football Club, but that was it. And so can we be sure that there will be accountability? No, no, we can't, because history will tell you that that isn't what happens. It's too hard for working people in this country to fight for justice. It takes too long. The battle takes too much out of them. They have the original injustice, and then the battle for justice after, after it, it just completely takes so much out of them. Too hard for them to get justice. It's too easy for public and private bodies to cover up. And that is just a fact, because there are so many injustices, as Francis Said. So what and, would you do, said, Andy, to so change that? So let me come that. to what I would do, because I have a very specific uh, remedy. If something needs levelling up in this country, it's the scales of justice, because they are weighed against ordinary people, weighed against. Public bodies go to courtrooms and they hire the best QCs in the land. Bereaved families are often denied any legal support at all. What chance do they have when they're raw with grief going so into those do? courtrooms? A Hillsborough law. A Hillsborough law, Jake, which you have committed to as a government too, which should have a number of proposals that would rebalance the system. One, a duty of candour on public officials to tell the truth at the first opportunity. And if they did that and didn't cover up, they would spare people fighting for justice so much pain, so much grief, so much time spent in the wilderness lost. I just feel for these people who've been left in this situation. It is another stain on this country. But actually, what do we do? We come together and we say, a Hillsborough law now. Rebalance the scales of justice in favour of ordinary working people and ordinary families. Denied. I think the point that was made by the gentleman about whether or not when we see people in positions of power, particularly in government, not taking responsibility often uh, trickles down. I think obviously this issue is a different one, but it does seem to be a pattern across institutions, across large public bodies and private bodies of a refusal to take responsibility. You mentioned Grenfell uh, and Hillsborough, and these are huge scandals that lose confidence amongst the public in, in, in systems. And it's incredibly demoralising when these scandals happen and it goes on for so long and people do not feel like they can get 
any accountability and no one takes responsibility. And I do think when it comes to these situations, there needs to be some moral and political leadership in terms of setting an example and being completely transparent and honest to make sure that actually the public have trust within the system. Definitely. Quite right. <laughs> I work for the Ministry of Justice and I agree with your point. Since the Lamy review, nothing has happened. The balance of justice needs to be balanced. And then there's not, I believe if the Hillsborough event happened somewhere else in a more affluent area, there would have been justice straight away. Access to justice for common people, yep. for the working background, and especially if you're north, from the northern areas and you come from a, so, a low social mobility area, yep. access to justice is not there and it's difficult to find. Definitely. Do, do you just want to briefly answer the point that a couple of people have made here, including and I, about leadership from the top and showing an example? Well, I, I agree that there should be a duty of candour, actually, and that Hillsborough Law should come forward. I'm born and bred in the city of Liverpool, and I'm, I think you're doing a brilliant job working with the families. Andy, we may be on different times of the political fence, but you led an amazing campaign and we finally saw justice for our home city. But the wider point about how should the system, the politicians... No, no, the question I asked you was picking up on something that two people have said in the audience, plus and I, about leadership from the top and setting an example of transparency and candour. Well, the wider point, as I was just about to say, is that we do have to rebalance those scales of justice and it does come all the way from the top. So I think we need a duty of candour, leadership and transparency from the top of the government to the bottom of government and across society in the public sector. And do you think you're seeing that duty of transparency and candour now from the top? Well, I mean, I, was a, I, I do think we are seeing that. I think the way that the government has come forward and the Prime Minister, guess what, with the elephant in the room, but the Prime Minister has come and apologised for what took place in Downing Street during lockdown. And I think that was the right thing for him to do. Um, we will have to wait and see what the Metropolitan Police report says. But my view is that no stone should be unturned. There should be nowhere okay. for anyone from the Prime Minister down to hide. When you're in public life, you're, you're subject to a higher level of scrutiny, and that's quite correct. OK. Yeah. Our hour is up, Jürgen. I'm so sorry. You wanted to come in, but I'm afraid we are out of time. Thank you to the panel for thank coming you. here this evening. Thank you to all of you for coming and being part of our audience. And, of course, thank you to you at home for watching. From Leeds, from Question Time. Bye-bye. <laughs>